find yourself a, a mentor or work for somebody that you know you look up to as a mentor who is skilled in what he's doing and that's i'm talking for the the woodworking aspect and you will learn the actual practical knowledge that you need on a day-to-day -day. and not only that now you're involved with like a business owner or like a company so in that regard you're going to learn so much more about how the real world works and not so much <laughs> Hey everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth. Today I'm joined by David Colas, who with his wife Lara is the founder and proprietor of Colas Modern, a bespoke furniture company here in Savannah that is also working towards transitioning into uh, doing a little more e-commerce. Um, so amongst other things, also a fellow skateboarder, also... <laughs> David helped provide the pallets, which turned into the crate marketing wood wall. So, um, yeah, he's uh, he's this is his first time in front of the camera, but he's been behind the scenes for a couple of years. We met when I produced a little promo video in 2018. So we've known each other for coming up on three years now um, to start it out. Do you mind just telling me who you are, what you do, what you sure. guys specialize in? Sure. So my name is David Colas. I am a furniture designer. I graduated from SCAD in 2012 for furniture and manufacturing. My wife and I, my wife Lara and I, we run Colas Modern, which is a um, modern furniture uh, and the home decor company. So we do all the design and production in our in our warehouse. We are basically in the in the process of going more e-commerce lately, given the events last year, and um, to an extent one thing that we are fairly passionate about is being a uh, brand innovator. So we do try to, well, we have designed several different brands and it's, it's a long process to get involved with everything, but one step at a time. Yeah. So Colas Modern is kind of like the overarching yes. parent company. Yes. It's uh, we've had a lot, we've had to learn a lot over the, over the years at first. Um, I think the process seems, like fairly straightforward and simple you have a lot of ideas and you just want to see them all uh take place but then um over time when you see how much is involved in all the steps of setting something up or or figuring yourself out in in that realm um it brings reality back down a little bit so um now it's more strategic i would say the process has to be more strategic in this at this point and you didn't start as Coles Modern, right? Yes, that's right. So initially when we started the company, we were called Design More. What we did for several years was offer laser cutting as a service as a, um, uh, for local individuals, companies, and students as well. And that merged into us launching our first collection in 2017. And that's where really when we did the transition over to um, our, our current state where we're focusing on, on home furnishings. And that's really the brand that we're pushing forward now. So what are some of the lines and the sub brands underneath the Colas Modern umbrella? So we do have Modern Heritage, which is our furniture, uh, really more like the furniture brand. We've got Feli Feli, which still requires quite a bit more work, uh, but that's more of a urban, uh, an urban fashion kind of brand. So there's still a lot more work that needs to be done there. Uh, all the details of how we're going to go about all that stuff. And then finally, again, I, due to last year, Design More will have a comeback at some point. Uh, we've seen that for ourselves, the laser has been really important in terms of our production. But we have been getting uh, more contacts of people who are interested in knowing if we still offer that. And so why not? I mean, we're trying to see how we can develop that. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, I had I've told this story on Creative Truth before. I had this idea called Conversations with Creatives mm -hmm. back like five or six years ago before mm -hmm. I really even knew what podcasts were. Yep. And I even recorded an episode with Alex and I, who's been on the show. Okay. And um, it didn't turn into anything. But then now five or six years later, it came back in mm -hmm. a different iteration. Yep. And so I also like... I've tried everything. I've planted a lot of seeds. I have like a sunglass company called mm -hmm. Honey Sunnies. That That's I, awesome. That, you know, someday you yeah. know, I might revive. But sure. for now, it's just like dormant. But it's just interesting how those things come and go. You know, that's a good point because it's funny you mention it. Um, 
our our collection that we have now the first piece uh that I guess that became like the first piece of the collection it had originally been designed back in early tw 2014. Um, and that was, you know, I do a lot of sketches. So I try to plan things ahead, but at the same time, I realized that there's a whole fabrication aspect. So I try to flesh things out, but the first piece was originally designed like three years earlier. And then we had to come back to like revisit it and then I finally prototype it. And one thing led to another. So the process is still the same. There's still drawings today that have not seen the light of day, but will do so once we evaluate that, hey, this would be this would be meaning, meaningful or this could make sense or maybe let's remove this other uh, offering. So yeah, it's it's kind of interesting how that works. Um, I think you learn patience over time and maybe even not to overstress certain things uh, and just let the natural flow of um, events take place. So did you have this vision in your mind when in 2012 or, or whenever you were, you like knew you wanted to be self-employed and grow mm -hmm. a business? Yeah, you know, I would say that it, it must have um, originated even prior to coming to SCAN. And um, what, what came to me naturally was that I taught myself how to paint and do graphic design originally before, before coming to SCAN. And it worked out really good. I mean, I was doing, um, what's it called? Uh, kind of freelancing online back when online was not like it is today where you have like Fiverr and you can actually get hired. So I used to be on the forums and um, as a teenager and people would ask for some graphic design elements to their like um, username tag. And that was like a big thing back in the day. So I would design a bunch of stuff and I was really in a sense looking at, uh, I was inspired by a lot of other much more experienced graphic designers, but I would try to emulate their um, their techniques and a lot of all that was all done in Photoshop. So um, it's technical enough that, you know, you can see it, but reproducing something that looks similar involves a lot of effects and everything. So you really have to learn the program. So that's that was one thing. And then the painting was um, it came to me naturally. I just enjoyed, you know, putting um, acrylic or oil paint on canvas and finding a way to like express that. And so those were really the ways that I had originally found an outlet in art. And um, those were the means that uh, got me to SCAD originally. When I came here, it was a bit of a pivotal time because that was the recession. And um, I had been advised that a career as a painter at the time was going to be quite difficult. So I pivoted back then to decide to do something that still involves a lot of the um, more tangible aspect of producing something. Uh, of SCAD's extensive list of majors, furniture, industrial, and I, interior design struck out, but furniture was the one where I felt I would actually be able to um, still express on this unique canvas, which would, in back then, I thought, hey, a, a piece of furniture, wooden chair or whatever, was the one way to still express this desire to make something that you can call your, your own. Um, and funny enough that's where i've kind of stuck <laughs> well and it runs in your family yes and it does and that was a later discovery um which really came up when my wife and i when we got married i had family that that um just asked me if i was aware of this history of craftsmanship on um, my father's side and they really opened the doors to all this knowledge that was not privy to originally or maybe it was just hadn't been shared and then now i was aware of it and all this um, um these tools that my grandfather had kept for so long found new utility in me just wanting to have them keep them and show them to you know my kids today by the same time because i'm in that process of actually um fabricating something it just is a pretty neat reminder of, hey, back, you know, over 100 years ago, this is what they physically were using and someone's hands was on this. Um, and now it's been passed down to me. And so I still feel um, there's a connection there that's pretty unique, I think. You said um, you said eight generations, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. So as far back as we can trace, yeah, uh, back to the 1700s, or like early 1700s, which it's pretty incredible enough, I think. Uh, then later on, we have some pictures, some early photography, which is kind of neat to see. It was like pre-World War, uh, the first the Great War, really, World War One, And so you kind of see some of um, my ancestors. 
and uh, obviously black and white photos. But that, yeah, that provides context, I would say. It definitely provides context to that lineage. It's almost like it's baked into you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, and you know, my, my second older brother, he's actually an engineer. He grew up being very tactile, like always like making something. He was into uh, RC planes and RC helicopters. So he would build a lot of his own modules and he would mess around with the controller to really customize these things. And so he was selling individual like customized units. Um, I had an affinity for Legos and I really liked building unique things growing up. And I, no one really saw that I had this path that I could take where I was also going to be uh, involved with my hands because for my older brother or my second older brother, it was more apparent. I mean, he, and he's an engineer today, so it was really apparent and they saw that. And I think the, um, for myself, it was more, it, I was like nurturing all these ideas in my head and then physically, uh, it was like a phys small physical manif manifestation on Legos, but somehow in my head, it was really much wider than that. So when I took on painting, it wasn't a stretch for me because I could see how I can construct certain things a certain way. And I had a lot of definitely influences like major painters who their style and, or what they painted or, you know, what they were going through in their lives in terms of the, the period of, uh, of painting that they were doing, how it influenced them. That did give me like a little bit of a background as you know what does it mean to be a painter and how do you find your own style and I think that I struggled that at first like what is my style or who am I in, in the painting world and originally even in furniture same thing you want to figure out what you like best and how you're most useful with this skill you can provide well and it evolves too because and it does yeah yeah exactly you and I have talked about how Cole's modern the emphasis was like super modern mm -hmm. um furniture and uh mm -hmm. it's kind of now modern heritage the line yep. is kind of blending the old with the new so. exactly yeah and i've been at my crafts for a, a while mm -hmm. but it's constantly just evolving and changing that's right so you also mentioned something interesting to me uh the other day which is which i never would have thought of creating a table it's a standard height it's a yep. standard width you know it's got to be pretty structurally sound mm -hmm. um but it's not super complicated right it's a slab with four legs or, exactly. or you know what yeah, yeah, yeah. some kind. <laughs> a chair yeah is a little more complicated for sure tell me about like what, what like the process and, and why well so for years for instance my wife has always told me oh you're strongest at chair design like looking at my sketches and everything and i had uh worked on several chair concept at scad which i definitely enjoyed but i put a lot of pressure on myself as well on those concepts because uh, well, we go through some formal furniture history and all that in the classes. And um, so some of the contemporaries that I admire, such as Eames, well, they iterated so many times on uh, pieces that today have become, you know, um, just world renowned and they're like, you know, uh, mid-century, you know, design. But they iterated a lot to get to a point that they thought was adequate before it really went to like market or before they thought, OK, it's done now. Um, that coincides a little bit with a painter's touch in the sense that you never, you can always add one more stroke, but you know, and to the viewer, to yeah. And to the <laughs> viewer, they'll never really see that. But when you are the one in, like doing that, you, there's always one, maybe one little thing you can add. And so the way I look at chairs now is definitely, I, I don't, yeah, I can, you know, put several pieces of wood together and as long as you can sit on it, it it's a chair. I, what I try to consider now is really the longevity of the piece, how it might be received over time, and also the durability of what you're actually making so that it makes sense and that it's not just to say you've made a chair and then it just gets lost in that context, but to make something hopefully and with the idea that when you iterate so much and then you come to that result that you're pleased with, it's almost like the piece itself now has a life of its own and other people who either interact or see or use it, they almost feel something with that this piece. And it's really like family heirloom. Yeah, it's it's an, it's unusual because you would say like the Eames lounge chair originally, after all these iterations that they did, it just took off and had a life of its own. And today it's still regarded as a really strong um, piece of furniture design. Um, and even for those who don't have any prior knowledge in furniture or furniture design or that world, 
they still have this unique appreciation for the piece without even you know really knowing too much into the 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 background and i think that that somehow i think the process really gives that extra life to the to the piece and you know it's it just change it, it the context is way different than just designing something for mass production um i think that that's one challenge i have now with how much i realize the chair design i want it to be something um just strong strong and and not for volume but just really for quality yeah and if they are something we talked about too is if they are mass producing them they've got these machines that oh yeah do yeah like <laughs> all the presses yeah. reps. exactly it's so impressive and i love knowing that those machines exist because yeah you see them in in action they're just doing all the like whether it's like a bent chair or metal whatever all the processes are there working in action I think what's unique and what's cool about that is you can build up to that point where it necessitates having to have, you know, that process be super efficient because it's like in demand, we'll say. Um, but leading up to just the that process and that experience of, oh, you're still physically, you know, doing that rounded cut and all that and everything to get it to be a piece that people like. Uh, and not just that, but once they are when they're when they're using it, they know somebody was personally involved in that production. I think that's that it's still it's still unique enough. I think um, you don't lose too much um, uh, character, perhaps. Now you um, walk me through. You've lived all over. Where you mm -hmm. where you where you're from? Where you've lived, and where Lara's from, and, and how you guys ended up meeting. Okay. Uh, so I'll start with the shorter, <laughs> the easier description. So my wife was born in, uh, Tampa, Florida. She was raised there and, uh, we met here in Savannah. So she comes from, um, Italian American family and, uh, on her father's side, that's all of the Italian big family and, uh, mom's side is from, uh, Florida. Yeah. So myself, Italians and Floridians. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I guess, I think it goes together. <laughs> it goes hand in hand. Um, Myself, I was born in West Africa, in Cote d'Ivoire, which um, in English would be Ivory Coast. Growing up, I traveled, or not just traveled, but really lived in six different countries. Seven, uh, seventh would be the, the States. And, um, and, and all those countries that we lived in were kind of like satellite locations that allowed us to, you know, as a family, travel and see you know, surrounding areas. So that was kind of unique. But most of my upbringing was Europe, Africa, and Asia. And so prior to coming to the States, I actually well, graduated in uh, high school in Malaysia and then came over to the States. So it's been um, quite a world trip almost in a sense, but it's been unique as well in two senses because it gives you that a sense of adaptability to different cultures and people. But at the same time, back then, the technology was not to the point where it is today. So as I got used to, you know, moving at the same time, all these people you met for the most part, you lose contact with them. Mm. And uh, especially when you're younger, by the time, you know, where I was in high school, well, in my space and Facebook were in their infancy. And then there started to become like this exchange that could be kept over time. But um, I would say that that looking back today, I would wish that there was an easy there had been an easier method to keep in touch with with people. Um, and then you, where'd you say you guys met here in Savannah, Lara and I met here in Savannah. Um, she was running a uh, art gallery at the time and I was basically completing my degree at SCAD and I was, uh, a friend and I were hosting, we're planning a, um, like our own senior show. And so we, uh, decided to do it at Ashmore gallery where she was in the gallery director. And so we arranged the whole thing. And so that was our little senior show. We invited um, professors, friends and everything. And so that's how originally how we met for myself. It was a very professional experience. You know, I was pretty much on my way out from college. So I had my sights on where I was going to go next. Uh, and I originally was planning on traveling uh, back out of the States to go to South Korea to teach English and just, you know, adventure kind of. Um, but following the exhibition we kind of kept in touch and then you know one thing like to another we began dating and now we've we're, we're you know expecting our third child this july so yeah and it feels it doesn't feel like it feels like time has probably gone by quick but at the same time like it 
doesn't feel like too long ago. It's, it's kind of unusual. Yeah, that is kind of like the. Yeah, it's like it feels like yesterday, but at the same time, yeah, feels you like realize. A time ago. Yeah, I think, exactly. I think that the, the, that feeling of it feels like a long time ago is because we changed so much. It's yep. like I was a different person. Yep. in 2012, mm-hmm. kind of thing. But um, what role do what role do you play within the business, and what role does Lara play, and then what do you do together? Okay, so I'll start with together. Together, we we definitely try to have some meetings. Uh, and see what tasks need to be either delegated or completed on both just like little admin or the whole a whole direction of a uh, whole design process myself i do all the design work i make sure that um the whatever designs we do or i've got the technical drawings and everything in place i really also oversee the uh managing of the production and um just the business as a whole. So I have to have my hands in a lot of things because uh, it's just the two of us. And Lara makes sure also, also managing um, the everyday operations and also uh, social media and what our brand looks like and what, you know, the direction we go into. And um, so, yeah, that's so we have to yeah share a lot of um, tasks, but at the same time, because we're a family, um, uh, because we've we've had children since now, we have to delegate the best we can. Uh, that's I would say that the the challenge that I've seen um, as an entrepreneur is not so much the business aspect. It I feel like once you grasp what you want to do and um, and you feel passionate enough to to um, develop it, that in my opinion is not what's difficult. Even there will be challenges and roadblocks and things to learn as you go. Excuse me. Um, but that's saying it, <laughs> uh, I would say it's a bigger challenge to be a parent and an entrepreneur at the same time, because mm. you're trying to be your best in two different worlds. One where you're really raising a child and there's so many unknowns. It's the first time for pretty much every stage of the way. And you want to give it your all, you want to be present. Uh, you want to, you know, also teach them or inspire them. And then on the inverse, you have, you know, this business, which, um, you know, people say, oh, like my business is like my baby or my first baby. And so that's already, I think, in people's minds how they treat a, a business. And so trying to do both at times, you have to um, just, um, what's it called? Compromise, not say compromise, but maybe a little bit where maybe something has to take priority. Uh, if a child is sick, for instance, well, you have to kind of put down um, something that you thought was immediate and make sure the child's okay. And at times there, but if you, if, you know, you, your child wants to play or something on and you know in their world it's always free time and you have this one deadline that you're really trying to meet well then you're like well you know i'm gonna have to choose to like not be able to play right now and i need to you know see this goal be met and i need to see the ball you know moving on some of these steps so i think that that's a big challenge uh it's actually a pretty incredible challenge Uh, but if you really enjoy the process of what you're doing, then it, it doesn't it doesn't stop you from doing it really. Um, and there yeah. and, and the kids are kind of growing up in the sh- in the shop exactly, and they're growing up you know with this experience, so it does offer them. And for whatever entrepreneur, I would say it does still. I think there's still a mindset that the parents who are entrepreneurs who have kids, there's still a mindset that the children will be able to tap into uh, to think for themselves or or to find solutions. Um, not to let, um, not to give up pers- uh, maybe. Um, so there's a lot of skills that can be passed down, uh, that way. And, uh, that's what we're noticing. So we see a lot of interest in, uh, our children and basically like sometimes the art, music, and even thinking creatively about certain solutions. We do notice that. And so, and it's not like we're always actively, you know, uh, trying to, um, Put that on them but just because they're observed they're constantly observing they're now returning the conversation with us and that's sometimes it's kind of funny hearing what they have to say um i'm not a dad yet but mm-hmm. i my gut says that based on where i've lived in my life that savannah is actually a really good town because mm-hmm. for for being a an entrepreneur dad mm-hmm. entrepreneur parents yep. because there's kind of this mentality of like it can wait you right. Can, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like urgent, yep. but like it's not that urgent. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so clients might be asking you for 
deliverables, but at the same time, there's this definitely like this emphasis on family mm-hmm. and uh, and um, maybe we're we're in other places um, like the like New York City or something, mm-hmm. for example there's not as much emphasis on family life and mm-hmm. it's more just about career 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 yeah that's a good point that's a very good point actually and um it'd be hard to speak about new york because i know so little but i uh my wife did live in new york study there for a little bit so she is the uh she's kind of told me you know what it's how the differences are and how savannah well slovana at times Slo- how, it, yeah, how it's uh definitely more it's easier to live as a family uh, and the uh, parallel I could make is that the little, again, I know of like Paris because I never really lived in Paris, but is uh, people are fairly fast paced and they've, it's like a, not to say just only a go-getter mentality, but um, it's definitely more individualistic and it's also very career driven, not to say it's not career driven here, but maybe there's, uh, there's more, um, it's a little bit more relaxed and um family values also are at the forefront. So uh, that's always a good thing. Um, how about um, just like generally, I think that it's um, not every couple can work together because some people feel <laughs> yeah. like you're at home all yeah, day yeah, together yeah. or all night <laughs> yeah. and then you're at work all day together. Yep. So what are like some secrets to, uh, I mean, and everyone wants to be Chip and Joanna Gaines, right? I know, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, what are some of like tips or um, like wh- you know how do you how do you how do you build that relationship where you can like not only be life partners but business partners? What's made it easier for us? It's sure in the beginning, even before we had kids, there was well, even when we had, before we had kids, we still talked a lot about business at home because you know there wasn't that other. A care you know that we really had to um to dedicate to so there was a lot more of that and a lot more of us doing what we wanted but at the moment we had kids yes that conversation really came up where do we just leave work at work the moment you leave or do we talk about it a little bit more at home but that becomes inconvenient very quickly um or yeah or it can clash very quickly so i think with the the boundary that we've given ourselves or like the way of thinking about it is when we come into the office well um it's like we're we're employed by our business and so we behave as such and all conversations are within that context and then when we go home um it's important to disconnect from that uh, mentality and you know take care of what needs to be done at home and once let's say the kids are in bed or whatever and you know you're still you still feel like willing to go into those subjects and definitely we still uh, are able to dedicate some time to reviewing certain things but you definitely have to delineate those um that responsibility or that that task because you don't want to overload like you like kind of touched upon um that can get uh dicey pretty quick well and you just i'm sure you just be like open about it like yep let's yep. uh let's leave this for it can and, wait and you know so i i would say the biggest so the biggest um advice i'm i don't know if i'd say advice but the biggest thing i would say is communication it has to be thorough and direct and transparent um not only is that a good um uh value for like a marriage you definitely want to have open and clear and you know communi- communication but then when you add again working together i have heard of a lot of uh sayings where it's like oh you should never work with like your spouse or whatever because it can like deteriorate really quickly and like ruin your marriage um well depends what you do so i can't speak for every realm but um my wife my my wife and i we work really well together um we share the same passion but at the same time um within both worlds home and work open clear communication is the best thing even if we disagree it has to be said like right away like that we disagree and then we then we find a solution from there as opposed to the silent treatment or whatever. So I haven't talked about this yet on creative truth, mm-hmm. but I'd say at least half of my guests thus far are all skateboarders, including, uh-huh. including David. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we've actually been pushing each other to like, we were trying to gab the other day, yep. um, that neither of us were really comfortable with, <laughs> but we were just like motivating each other and pushing yep. each other. And next thing you know, we're like jumping over a chair yeah. <laughs> and just doing That's tricks fun. that we wouldn't, yeah. that we wouldn't think we could still do. Yep, exactly. Um, 
But uh, yeah, a lot of entrepreneurs go in, uh, came from skateboarding, mm-hmm. and especially in the video world, I mean, that was my first love was mm-hmm. just filming my friends skate, and mm-hmm. then that turned into a career in in video and, and audio and that's excellent AV. So um, how like, and I don't want to focus on it too long, but I actually love the idea of starting a skate specific podcast where I talk to skateboarding business owners. Do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. So like, how is skating kind of like? Mot- like either motivated you or taught you less life lessons or mm-hmm. affected you as a as a business owner that's a great question um so i started skateboarding when i was i believe 14 uh 14 15 it was like back in middle school you know you have your group of friends and maybe for my experience it, it wasn't something i would have necessarily been able to just start on my own um but because it was a group Kind of like, uh, you know, you're back with your friends and everything. It started as a group thing. Um, and I was very involved with uh, varsity sports and everything. What I loved about skateboarding is that as I really um, uh, found like a really big passion in it, I found I loved how you could develop yourself and your own style. And so you're between yourself and another skateboarder or your friend, whoever it is, Uh, You can do both the same thing, but in two different ways. And um, over time, it, you know, the process of learning a trick, for instance, you're doing it hundreds of times and, um, and trying to get better. And some, a lot of my, uh, some, some of my friends were actually much older than me. So they were a lot more experienced, but being around them all the time, it it was not a sense of competition with them necessarily, but it was knowing that they could, um, perform at a certain level it made me want to make myself better so that we could perform at the same level. And we would, you know, then we would play a game of skate and it wasn't like, oh, I would just absolutely get destroyed. Uh, it would be a lot more fun. And then there, then maybe there's a sense of competition uh, that can really be generated. But today I would say that, yeah, for sure, skateboarding, the way I see it as an entrepreneur is that, you know, you learn through a lot of micro failures, sometimes big, sometimes small, and then you have successes as well. But even through those successes, you know that now that you've succeeded here, there's just this much more. There's like a whole other um, rung in the ladder that now you have to reach. And so the analogy with the skateboarding is that, you know, again, you fail a lot of times, but you still get back on and you still keep pushing forward. And you need to, it, it translates well into entrepreneurship because you, try not to take it personally you know that you're at this current level you are not able to achieve it but the, if you you know really dedicate yourself then uh there you are bound to you know find a way or maybe do it a just totally different way altogether um so yeah i mean growing up there was I, there's a lot of like skate prof- professional skaters that just influence you and in, like in so many different ways and they've become uh, entrepreneurs after their career was done and it's really interesting to see what they get into because for a good I would say for a good portion of the ones that I kind of like looked up to or whatever they've succeeded in that in that mission as an entrepreneur um, and then again you know you mentioned the video um, uh, getting the whole video side to it and that make becoming a career I would say and I think you could agree that a lot of music taste is also uh, we can attribute Absolutely. to skateboarding I mean that that is a big thing and that's a that's i would say it's a culture thing and you grow up with that and that again for entrepreneurship that can i mean the doors are wide open you could apply that to so many different things it's funny because here in savannah i've been i've met with several um people uh who are either uh uh, parents now today or just you know in their career and i've heard so many times now that they were like skaters when they were younger and everything and they oh used to love it riding here and there or like they were uh they lived at a point in time when they were at the original you know lords of Dogtown kind of thing in la and i'm like whoa this is fascinating and there is a lot more skaters right yeah yeah. there's a lot more skaters than you would uh that dna exists in a lot of different people um and that's why i think it's something that you know you and i can relate to would we would want to always keep pushing keep rolling 
Keep pushing, yeah. Yeah, keep pushing. No, I could talk about skateboarding oh, yeah, all sure. day, which is why it could be its own. <laughs> yeah, it, it but if you if you if you're listening and you skate, uh, let, let let me know if you think uh, we could you know do a do a whole podcast on its own about that specifically. But let's get back to uh, the business yep. uh, of, of making furniture and and housewares. Um, what do you like the most, and what what's the part you like the least about what you do? The the part I like the most is the process of the the image the design the idea being on paper somewhere in the beginning uh regardless of how long before it gets produced but then seeing the uh, the uh, process of the production taking place so it's that that actual process is so exciting because you're really you're whatever inspiration you had now it's becoming a real thing in the real physical world and i do like that probably even as much or more than the final piece once that you see it because that's like mission accomplished at that point um of course the actual building is fun um but the the pro the manufacturing process and the way we've laid out our our our, our um um workshop and everything that i would i find a lot of passion in that and making it the most efficient as possible uh and then uh on the other side of that i would say the thing i like the least um hmm that's a good question i'd say maybe making changes like midway or finding that something doesn't really work when you're about midway and yeah you had the fabrication drawings but then you encounter an issue uh which will require a change of design and but you've almost kind of committed to the process um i like that at least by the same time it forces you to find a solution because you're midway you're likely not going to want to waste whatever you're working on so you find a solution and maybe that becomes incorporated in this the next iteration so um i would say that yeah hmm. it can be frustrating at times and you know much bigger f um companies like for instance i'm gonna lean on tesla a little bit a little elon lean there but for instance he's been um put in the spotlight for when he would say uh, a, a certain model car would come out and then when that time comes around it's like people are like so where is this you know deliverable and he's like oh well we had um uh production nightmare i think that's how he put it so but that's just be and that is frustrating for him because he knows on paper the idea that they have but then in the process now there's like what one robot that fails at doing whatever and it, it halts the whole process and and then he knows what it needs to be like at the end but then and he's constrained to the expectations and so delivering on that can be very frustrating but you find you f you figure yourself out and well in, in this example in this particular example they figured it out the model cars came out and then you but it's still learning process the more you add it's not because you've done it necessarily once that the next one is just as easy there's there might be other things that you that you encounter so it's the same with uh, the furniture we produce every piece the, for instance a table might lend itself to being certainly more uh, straightforward than the putting together all the steps for a chair um and then when you hit that roadblock if you, you know, if that comes up then yeah it's always something where you have to um troubleshoot a little bit and that's really it can be frustrating so you mentioned the, po the possible revival of design more yes um what are some other ways and we've talked about potential of using augmented reality mm -hmm. that you would like to expand and grow in 2021 and beyond well you know we're latecomers on the e-commerce front i know that that's not a new thing but i think given the events last year in, in 2020 and covid and everything um we had just developed a marketplace like we, yeah marketplace. we just developed a physical marketplace to really bring and introduce people and talk to not only creatives but design professionals and, and people in the trade as much as uh people who would walk in and you know want to purchase something so we had spent all this uh, development and we had finalized it and everything had been built and planned an spent, open house planned an open house for april so we had done everything everything was ready in, in february we we're getting ready for this april event to open the doors officially well we delayed that um because obviously with lockdown restrictions um we had to respect you know how many people uh, were allowed in a group setting and throughout the remainder of the year we just um we figured okay word of mouth has gone has done well in savannah and it's been you know we've we've had our like way of working 
but then we realize that we there's this opportunity now to at least really have this e-commerce push because we have the product um we have the ideas or the steps that we need to take now it's just um upgrading our own platform and making sure that it is uh, available to everybody or more easily available to everyone and that we can extend that conversation um, that's certainly something that we are um, we're really learning a lot more today of it's severe yeah <laughs> <laughs> we're both doing it. <laughs> oh my gosh um, wait did I leave something out on that answer no but the next thing I wanted to follow up with is what are on the e-commerce front, what are some products that people can look for? I mean, what um, okay. what are you offering? So the e-commerce is going to be um, staged as a whole lifestyle. So there will be things that will furnish, let's say, your dining room, and um, then you can really build around the like, settings, we'll say. So over time, we'll introduce more things. But the idea, the biggest idea is that we want um, people to see it as um, a range of different products that you can get from the website. And they will range from... Uh, smaller products which um, are more accessible and then larger items which suggest that you're almost like remodeling or you're swapping out old furniture for new which uh, implies a bigger commitment uh, versus getting something as small as like I say an iPad holder or a keychain or whatever it is that we will we will offer as you know the entry level products mm -hmm. um, so yeah we want to, we want to establish it as a whole range of what our capabilities today allow us to do um, so we don't want it to become something where it necessarily uh, involves too many products like, you know, and I say that because I think of much larger firms uh, where people shop online for a whole range of different things like, you know, waste. Yeah, fountains and uh, yeah, 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 fireplaces. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we don't want to involve too much, but uh, make sense with um, consumers today who are a certain demographic where maybe they're just getting into spending for stuff in their home or people who already have a home and have kids and there are certain things now that they are looking into getting, transitioning, whatever furniture they might have, but being able to also shop for more than just, you know, larger physical furniture and also, but also look for smaller items. So we're, we're examining more now how we can incorporate some of these smaller items so that people can, can, um, can understand the whole idea of the lifestyle, but also be involved as, you know, they're not just buying furniture, they're, they're, they're um, in a sense, uh, becoming kind of like our family and seeing what we are interested in because all the items we will present on the e-commerce are things that we personally um, would buy or that's how our own home is furnished. So it's, it's infused with a little bit of our own personal style and preferences um, and, and, you know, kind of offered to the world. So specifically... Um, on the modern modern heritage line, yep. the butler boards, is that yep. modern heritage? Yes, it is. So, so there's there's something called the butler boards, which I love the idea of you'll um, adapt a, a a prototype that maybe you know you have to improvise mid process, yep. and then you create something, and then now you have the ability to create something virtually and see mm -hmm. if there's an interest. Mm -hmm. And if it sells, then you can start figuring out the manufacturing process. Yep. And if not, you can just go, okay, on to the next thing. Exactly. But the Butler boards, um, they're, uh, they're cutting boards, they're custom cutting boards. And uh, they're made right here in Savannah mm -hmm. by the by Colas Modern. And um, they've got a little bow tie and yep. suspenders and little buttons yep. on them. And it was something that you weren't necessarily um, having the intention of making it part of your core business model, yep. but they're popular. Yeah, they, they be, it's so funny you bring that product up because it was designed a little bit on the whim. I was, um, I don't even necessarily remember the year. I think it may have been 2017, maybe 18. Uh, and it was, I think it was seven, it could have been end of 17, but it was designed on the whim. And by uh, what I mean is like, uh, it wasn't like I was putting a bunch of like time or whatever on it, but I had seen like, oh, you know what? It would be funny to do uh, like a board with like a bow tie and like, like um, giving this board like a personality and um, and more so than the personality. I was I was really into inlaying woods and like doing contrasts and everything, but it was not really intended to become something else than that idea. And over time. And this is what I love about manufacturing is over time, that one little idea, which looks nothing, the original Butler board looks nothing like the one we have today, 
but that that's what i like about that process we just continually improved it continually uh, refined the the process and from a board that was just a mishmash of like different woods all glued up and then still had a bow tie but the details were not really fleshed out over time it became very specific and there were very specific looks the manufacturing all got all of that got sorted out and now it's very easy to know oh okay this pattern this and that um that yeah that is a it's a funny product to think about because they really came just like like that hmm. um we're uh, coming up on towards the end here. So one of the last questions I always ask is uh, for for people that are uh, maybe just finishing up high school or they're in college and they're about to finish up college. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're not in college yet um, to become a furniture maker or a mm-hmm. craftsman or a woodworker. Mm-hmm. Um, do you need to go to college do you need to go to a a high-end art college like scad Mm -hmm. do you can you just go right into the trade i mean um can you learn stuff online what are some kind of pieces of advice you'd give people to fast can you apprentice i mean Mm -hmm. i mean how do you get started in this industry maybe you don't have a wood shop at home Mm -hmm. um so how do you get your feet wet and your hands dirty to start the process well i hope gosh i hope my answer doesn't upset anybody but (laughs) If you want to get into woodworking, don't go to college for it. That's what I would say, um, because you, I mean, the skill set of you know, if you are, if you like working with your hands, first of all, um, college is not going to teach you how to be necessarily like more passionate about working with your hands. Uh, you're going to learn new skill sets, new insight, new pieces of history that all inform, uh, but the practical um, use of, I mean, the, in in practice. Um, find yourself a, a mentor or work for somebody that you know you look up to as a mentor who's skilled in what he's doing and that's I'm talking for the the woodworking aspect and you will learn the actual practical knowledge that you need on a day-to-day and not only that now you're involved with like a business owner or like a company so in that regard you're going to learn so much more about how the real world works and not so much theory because uh, you could take theory, but then when you need to apply it to, you know, start a business and find finan- financing and all these different things, those are not necessarily taught in that um, in, a, in a certain program. Um, so that pertaining to woodworking, that's what I would say. Now, if you want to have um, like a title, like furniture designer, for instance, it may be useful to get some kind of certificate uh, or like uh, going through a program where you earn a certi- certain certificate to have that. And I think the difference between the woodworker and the, you know, quote unquote, furniture designer is going to involve uh, more technical aspects to, um, you know, how do you look at design and not just like um, fa- a fabrication drawing, but the, the trends, uh, material, uh, almost like a, not say material science, but like the, the material use and how that blends into uh, interior design. So you're really trying to inform the um, yeah, it's not functional on its own. It's functional yeah, in an environment. Yeah, exactly. Because you could go, f- you could study furniture design, but then just get uh, hired to work on the computer. Which you know, you need to you need to be proficient on the computer to uh, you know render all these models and all these things, and have zero experience actually making anything. Um, but you are useful because you are helping the fabrication department now to know, or like, or the engineers to know what this needs to look like. These are the specs. And if it needs any revisions, well, the people who are making it will give you feedback on those revisions. Um, but then again, now, if you have the skills to do, to understand the material and you have that background, that does complement, that does allow you to have uh, different channels. Now you understand the material, you also understand the theory, and now you can apply them to either match a trend, match an industry, a sector, uh, and get more creative with it to like, make it your own at that point. And I don't want to discredit like you know woodworkers you know, because I admire so many YouTube woodworkers who are didn't who you know demonstrate that they weren't in design college per se, but they're super creative in their own sense. But um, maybe. They're also they also know that they're they they want to stay in a certain um, area of expertise and not necessarily branch into certain other things. So, um, I mean, personally speaking, I just enjoy manufacturing so much. It's good to have had that theory and to know how the material behaves. Um, so, yeah, again, is creativity inherent or is that cultivated? Wow. Um, 
I think some individuals are born with inherent co uh, creativity uh, and that could, I'm not going to go into nurture versus nature and everything, but I think some individuals are born with that and there are others who discover it over time uh, where maybe it was circumstance or whatever else, but I think everybody has their own sense of creativity. If it's not like, um, if it's not apparent at first, I think there's a way to discover it. And that's why, you know, there's like forums I and, mean, you know, you have, you have people who give talks and who like empower you. Oh, you don't, maybe you don't know how to do this today, but you know, commit yourself to blah, blah, blah. And then if, over time you are expected or, you know, you're almost uh, praised that you have this inner energy to become the most creative you can always be. So I think there is um, an area of development where anybody can be creative. Um, it's just going to depend on, you know, you know, who you are, what point in time are you able to, you know, really unlock this p inner potential and others are, yeah, again, could be, could be born with that inner potential already exhibiting those signs early on. I make the connection with my, like my engineer brother who from a very young age, he exhibited those signs and he physically showed them any toy he would get, he would deconstruct them and put them back together. Uh, either with like different components or he was really exhibiting that with myself, you know, that didn't show till like high school almost, but it was in me, but it just didn't, it was like, I was not, it was like not unlocked yet. Uh, I was way more into sports, you know, basketball, skateboarding, all these other varsities. And yeah, I definitely enjoyed art always, but it never occurred to me like, Hey, this would actually become my, my uh, career path or, you know, use that whole innate like creativity to become something. So I would maybe say, Perhaps I had a, a, a grain of like creative creativity in you know just in me, but I really unlocked it, the full potential of it much later. Um, and so, do you, I, do you consider yourself an artist? Oh, for sure, yeah. First and uh, foremost, before before craftsman. Oh, that's ooh, wow, <laughs> that's a heavy one. <laughs> um, I would to to keep it simple. I would say yes, just because. Prior to getting into the craftsmanship, I developed maybe the craftsmanship of being like my own version of me as an artist that was like painter. And because I just enjoy working with my hands, that translated into craftsmanship and that attention to the detail just as much as it could have been a paint stroke. Now it's like, you know, a cut on wood. So I think that I would now I can say, yes, it's become craftsmanship, but um, it would be untrue to say I knew it was craftsmanship beforehand. Um, or maybe, maybe, Hey, maybe I'm, I'm making some artists mad. Maybe they're like, Oh no, my art is all craftsmanship. I know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it depends. There's art is so subjective. Well, it was absolutely. We preach, uh, we preach not worrying about what the, what everyone else thinks and, yep. and just, uh, do your thing and, you know, keep your head down and, yeah, just, yeah. and just stay focused <laughs> and stay true. And don't, exactly. cause if you're focused on what everyone else thinks, Mm -hmm. you're not going to be true to yourself exactly. in your art form and in, in your creative venture. Mm -hmm. Boring, boring, practical question and, and uh, comment on something we talked about earlier this week. Uh, when you're self-employed, you have to find, do all, there's a, there's a book called the E-Myth, the entrepreneurial myth. Mm -hmm. Not only are you an artist, not only are you a craftsman, not only are you learning how to use all these software programs, you're dealing with clients, you're having to file taxes and find yourself oh, yeah. health insurance and stuff yeah. like that. So, um, I mean, uh, one anecdote you gave me was, you know, that, uh, you know, that Lara's going to be having another, th your third child. Mm -hmm. So you kind of throttle down your health insurance and throttled yeah, up yeah, hers. Yeah, 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 for sure. So that's another part of entrepreneurship that, um, people, that's part of the entrepreneurial myth, they call it, where mm -hmm. they can be the, um, Oh, what's the book say? They can be the the uh, person that actually executes the task, but yep. they don't necessarily. Not everyone has what's in it. Uh, what's in what is required to be a manager of mm -hmm. those people, and then an entrepreneur as well. So mm -hmm. there's many. Like you have to do everything when you're self employed. Yes. Um, that wasn't a question. I just was like rambling. I think there, you answered so. it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, not at all. I mean, thank you asked it and you answered it i know time. i just wanted to yeah. talk i just wanted my my <laughs> time to ramble um but uh 
give me give us a give us a plug. I mean, how can people mm. find more? And I want to if you guys have if you're listening, if you have questions for David and Lara, I'd love to have Lara on as well. Yeah, yeah, I'd love that to would have be great. You, I'd love to have you back on to talk more just about skateboarding. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you have questions about that, you can uh, you can you know drop them below if you're listening watching on YouTube, or uh, you can send me an email at wecreatetruth mm-hmm. at gmail dot com if you're if you're listening. So uh, plug plug the business, plug the business is and uh, how do people find you guys? You can find us on Instagram at Colas Modern Design, and our website is uh, colasmodern.com. Um, that's the two main areas. Now we have a Facebook. Uh, we're not very active on there. So our website, our Instagram, are the great two great places to find us. Soon, once our e-commerce site is up, I will hopefully be able to come back on here and just give that new update. Uh, we'll try to be you know as good as we can online um, to give. You know, people to hype it up a little bit and kind of get it going. Cool. Yeah. Um, any other closing words before we close out? Um, since we are on the entrepreneurship um, um, subject, I would say it is. Some people are more prepared to take on uh, the challenges and roadblocks that entrepreneurship entails, and others may be less inclined i would say now i know um do you know individuals who perhaps try to get into entrepreneurship it's definitely daunting because you depending on what you do again because you know not everything is not every um, career path is the same but it, everything really relies on you your motivation how you're feeling and then if you're sick for instance well um there you go that gets kind of gets cut um for instance, my uh, my oldest brother, he's a, a wine importer in Canada, but everything relies on his presence, his trip to France to find the uh, producers and then bring back this knowledge and actual product there. But if anything were to keep him from doing that, whether he got sick or whatever, it can it can really slow down or impact that. And similarly here in in our cases, basically, you know, all of that work really depends on you. You don't have somebody over your um, your shoulder, and that's maybe a negative connotation. But you don't have somebody necessarily dictating what needs to be accomplished and done. And you know what? To a certain extent, there uh, that can be a good thing to to be in line with a company and individuals that you really you care about the message and what they're doing, and you know being part of that mission to uh, to grow this business or to you know better your skills under this. Um, this company or in this career path that that can be very fulfilling. And, um, so for entrepreneurs, yeah, it's a different, um, it's almost a different DNA altogether, but you are, um, you're in your own world liable for all the choices you make. And it's incredible to know that one little decision and, uh, and consistency can lead to where you ideally want it to go. Um, yep. You have to be self-sufficient, self-motivated. So, yep, exactly. I mean, as creative people, I mm-hmm. had to. I've had to learn a lot of um, organizational systems mm-hmm. to make sure, to balance everything and right. to, and to uh, juggle all the different tasks. Exactly. So, yeah, and I'm still learning. And I mean, that that's part of the goal of this podcast. There's always another rung in the ladder. Yeah, 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 no, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. And 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 just like learning from people, and like I've learned. I've, I mean, I've. I always I always learn something from you from you, but I've learned a lot today, yeah. and I appreciate you coming on. Well, so. thank you for having me. I'm really delighted. Yeah, definitely. Man. I'd love to. Uh, yeah, keep this chat going for sure. Yeah. We'll, we'll do it again sometime. Awesome. Sounds so, good. in upcoming episodes of the Creative Truth, I'm going to be talking to uh, more artists, creative professionals, and entrepreneurs. And so, if you have suggestions for guests or uh, episode feedback, you can reach me at wecreatetruth at gmail if you're watching on YouTube, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And if you're listening, go ahead and leave me a good review on your favorite podcast platform. Uh, you can learn more at creative-truth.com. We have some apparel up on the site. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening.